Good morning. Welcome to Karen's um, parenting class. We're glad to have you with us. We've been going over a number of items in the past um, three or four weeks. And so we kind of want to pick up where we left off with the concept of transitioning. Before we do that, I'll just go over the sanctuary real quick again um, to help refresh that because it is difficult when you're in the heat of the moment of parenting to stay connected and to stay uh, focused on our goals and of, of what the sanctuary helps us to do. So I do want to just review that again quickly with you. Um, here we have the Good Shepherd Jesus, and he's inviting us and the little lambs and our children to come into the sanctuary. And the first step is the gate of praise. And um, it's so easy to be critical of ourselves, of our parenting, and of our children, and of human beings. It's a part of the sin problem, is this root of criticism that we have. And if we remember that the name Satan means accuser, that can help. Because here we have the wolf on the outside or the uh, lion that's roaring. He's always going to be accusing and, and causing us to think negatively about our children, to think negatively, to speak negatively about our children to other people even, and to speak negatively towards them. And so it is a process to break away from that, connect with the positive things that Jesus is thinking and feeling about us and our parenting and the children and to move forward from there and to try to put everything, even the most negative things, in the best light possible, the most positive way to present it uh, to our children and to, uh, to process it in a positive way as we bring them into the sanctuary. Step number two is the altar of sacrifice. And even the word sacrifice, as we think of Jesus and his sacrifice for us, he had to humble himself to make that sacrifice for us. He had to see our value. He had to feel that that sacrifice was worthwhile. Um, in order to reach us. And so that humility is, is something that we um, need to engage in at step number two, is that we are going to sacrifice and be humble for our children the best that we know how to reach them. And as we do that, we open our hearts to the Holy Spirit and to God, and we open up their hearts to the Holy Spirit and to God. And so that's step number two. And step number three is uh, washing with the water of the word. So words are communication. We have the Bible that um, God communicates with us, and we have prayer that we communicate with God. But this um, communication is where we are going to be communicating with our children. We're going to try to open up safe communication. If we have... Um, a positive view, if we're trying to humbly seek the Lord to know how to reach our children, then we can open up more positive and deeper trust uh, communication between, um, between our, our children and us. And what I'd like to say to children and what I'd like to say to ourselves as parents is we can say it the same exact thing in a nice way. It's just amazing how habitual it is. We want something. We're expecting subconsciously resistance. And so we right away, we start saying things in a negative or harsh or very pushing way right from the get-go instead of saying, how can I say this nicely? That's what we want the children to do. We say that they want a toy. And so they yell and they grab and they hit for that toy almost immediately sometimes and we can just say let's say it in a nice way you can have a turn with the toy let's do it nicely but it's just amazing how we have that same problem as parents um, and teachers that we start off with saying um, it in a forceful way when it can just be a very kind request and open up that communication back and forth or asking I, I heard one of you speaking this morning and just rather there was an issue and that you just asked the child um, a question 
just to find out more information and help them to feel heard right from the get-go. And so there was a, a, a dialogue that happened rather than resistance that happened right at the beginning and try to work it through. Even if you think you know the answer, it's just better to open up communication and, and, and see what we can do from there. And then that opens us up then to step number four, the, the, which the candlestick represents the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit brings what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So that opens up those pathways for us and for the children to be filled with the Holy Spirit. It also includes wisdom, knowledge, understanding, counsel, power, fear of the Lord, and discernment or good judgment. The seven aspects of the Holy Spirit. And you can find those in Isaiah 11. So once that Holy Spirit is filling our hearts and our children's hearts and our homes, we are really moving forward to a spirit-filled family and spirit-filled life. Um, so that being said, now we'll transition over into step number seven where we're talking about the needs. Um, the needs that our children have is the root to why we see the bad behavior because they simply do not know how to get those needs met in um, acceptable ways and so they're trying to get those legitimate needs in unacceptable ways and a lot of times as parents we feel that because they're acting unacceptably that that is not a legitimate need and we want to squash the need rather than try to address the need and require them to take the steps to handle it appropriately to get that need met and so that helps us to troubleshoot and solve problems so much more successfully. So we left off with um, the need that children have and that human beings, all of us have, for transition from one activity to another activity or from being in left brain to go now into right brain or from being in right brain and now we need to move into left brain. Just a quick example of the left and right brain. Left, and, left is logical and the right is more emotional um, and spiritual and those kinds of things. Um, so if you have a left brain activity would be something more like work. And you know that when children are in right brain and maybe they're playing, they're being creative, do they want to work? Do they want to clean up? Do they want to do any of those things when they're all in this creative mode, etc.? Um, no, and you can think of us as, as you know, adults. When we're doing a right brain activity, we're not always ready to transition in one second either. Um, and then it could be vice versa. Maybe they're cleaning up and they, you know, they don't want to come to worship or they don't want to come and do something with the family. They've got their own agenda and it's, it's hard to transition. So there are ways to transition so that we're not having so many blow-ups over that. And there may be still some blow-ups, but at least we can solve as many problems as possible and work on that transition. Uh, we spoke about that a little bit in the last um, session. And uh, so I'm just going to go over now um, some, uh, oh, before I do that, I will say that the other kind of transitioning that we can, uh, that we need to think about is when there are long-term behavioral problems that have taken a long time to get here because maybe we didn't parent them right, maybe somebody else parented them in a, in a way that we have some negative character qualities that every time we come to something, it's always the same because here is these patterns that have been almost built in stone. And so we want them to transition now from bad behavior, bad character qualities to good behavior and good character qualities. And so that is gonna take a process and um, so when, when I see something that is a bad character quality that we really need to work on, then I feel like a sit-down talk when, they're, when it's totally away from the situation. And um, if, you have a, if it's just in the family, I, as a teacher, I may need to take that student aside and just say, hey, I'd like to go over some things with you. And I would start out with words of affirmation and positive things that I see in them. We always start out with positive because remember the enemy, the devil, 
has nothing better to do than all day long is criticizing that child. I know as a child that negative things happened to me and I connected with a negative self-concept in many different areas. And it was a daily thing that I'm not good enough, I'm, I'm not, my personality isn't appreciated, I'm not needed, all these negative things as I'm going through the cleansing in the sanctuary now, um, I see how when I was a child, the devil was trying to connect me with these negative things. And so I'm just taking a side moment to say, whatever we can do, because we know that our children are being bombarded moment by moment by the devil with these negative thoughts, whatever we can do to bring in positive thoughts is going to help lift them up and be um, a, a battle zone there for the devil that we're fighting back then from these negative thoughts to say positive things. So whenever we're starting out any kind of long-term transition plan, then we need to start out with some positives and say are there are positive character qualities, and, but then we need to be able to address and say, let's, we have an area that we need to work on and, um, and, and maybe ask them some ideas. And that, that can be a whole seminar in and of itself to talk about how to work through almost like a little counseling session with your child. Um, I do want to just bring out here that this is also a time that you can have a family conference. And that's um, a, a really helpful thing. You might want to start one-on-one -on -one with a child, but then you can, you can deal with things as a family and say, look, we've always been doing things here but we want to transition into some new pathways, some new patterns, some new ideas that we want to do. And here's some steps, some practical steps to get from point A to point B. Rather than, if we're not thinking about this and not planning on this, rather than what is instinctual is say, oh, you always do this, or you never do that when we're upset at the child when the bad behavior has cropped up again, we are just going to be more likely to just criticize that child. And maybe they do almost always do this wrong thing. Maybe they do never do this other thing. But to just shout that out is not providing the transition into new behaviors and new patterns of behaving and thinking and feeling. Um, as well as being, as we discuss with the children on any kind of long-term plan of change, um, we're going to be trying to troubleshoot for why is that happening, the, the motives behind why do we have this bad behavior, and that can be a part of our new plan as we try to meet those needs, etc. So that's um, the, t this, the three basic categories, as I see it, um, that look for, for times when we need to transition. And I'll just go over those again. When we're, they're moving from one activity to another, when they're moving from left brain to right brain or right brain to left brain, um, or when we have bad long-term habits moving into good long-term habits. It didn't happen in a moment. It's not going to happen in a moment, those changes. We need a transition plan to work those through. Um, I will just uh, go over some steps for uh, that, that I kind of see myself when I'm trying to move a child from one activity to another or from left brain to right brain and right brain to left brain. Um, is that when, usually what's happening is that the child is not doing something with me. G generally, they're doing their own thing and I'm coming into the scene and I'm gonna try to transition them. And this is true in um, pre-K and uh, childcare centers and in our home. This, th these are things to keep in mind when we want to transition children. First of all, I come and I affirm them about what they have been doing and are doing currently to help to, to first of all, they need affirmation. And second of all, a lot of times, if they've been playing nicely, and I'm going to use that kind of an example, they've been doing wonderful things. And they don't get credit a lot of times for all that they've done good. And so they feel happy that they've been doing something good. They feel affirmed. But they also feel like their blueprint is being appreciated, which the blueprint is the personality of the child, their gifts, their strengths, the plans God has for their lives. That's their blueprint. If you think of a blueprint of the house, when you're going to build a house, 
you have a blueprint of what you want that house to look like when it's a finished product and where, how to follow that blueprint plan to get the finished product that we want. And that's what God has done with children. He has a blueprint plan for those children. And he, they're just in miniature, but they're growing up and their characters are developing. And so that blueprint is something that, that is a part of their big needs that we have not talked about a lot yet. But it's a, it's a big part of their need is to have us recognize their blueprint and appreciate their blueprint. And that helps them to connect with it and move forward with it more and more as we affirm them in that. So that can, can be an opportunity. If it's a little child, you can say, wow, you've built, really built an elaborate, well, that's not a <laughs> word for a little kid, but um, you've really built a big um, building here. I love this building. It's, you've done this and so and that kind of a job. You can point out uh, positives about their building project that they did or their art project that they did. And then you can let them talk about their building project and, and how good they feel about it. And so then that helps them feel positive. It gives them an opportunity to express themselves, develop their linguistic skills to verbalize and put in words what they've been working on for a while. And um, it also helps them to wrap up, because we, we're wanting them to transition, right? It helps them to wrap up the project they've done by saying, ta-da, we even think about how God, when he did the creation of every single day of creation, at the end he said, oh, this is good, and um, wow, and he probably looked around and he saw his finished product, he put words around it, and then it was the end of the fourth day or the end of the fifth day. And so in order for the, for the children to say, okay, I'm done with this project, we need to talk about it. We need to verbalize it a little bit and look at it and see and appreciate it. Um, then the other thing is, is that also helps them to reconnect with us. Because if they're by themselves, and, or with other children, or their peers, or whatever, they're not necessarily in connection with us. So if I'm going to be the shepherd now, shepherdess, to move them from one activity to another, then I need them to connect with me. And so then I'm talking with them, and I'm affirming them, and there's a loving connection that can happen. Um, as we now are going to turn and move to the next, uh, the next step. Okay, and I even put down here, it ties a nice knot on that activity, like a little bow or a knot on a package, to complete it and finish it. And they feel more completed and finished there. And it can only take um, 15 seconds to do that if you're in a hurry. Or it can take a minute if you have a little bit longer to go back and forth. It doesn't have to be a long thing if you're in a hurry. But the more you do it and give a little more time when you have maybe three or four minutes, the, the faster they will go in the future because they get used to this. They get to the place where they really understand, I'm going to appreciate, be appreciated and loved and valued for what I'm doing, and I'm, then I'm going to move forward with the person who's leading me. Okay, so now we're ready to transition them. We've connected with them. We've summed and tied a knot on that activity. Then we're going to maybe give them a transition statement with a limit to it. They may need some time. They may need, need more than just that one second that I gave them so far in that. Um, that. So I'm, I often say something like, well, maybe you can finish um, that last round of the game. Or uh, maybe you can finish um, you, your, your building for a few more minutes. Or in about five or ten minutes. Um, and then we can talk about what we are going to do next. Sometimes it's easier. If they're not ready to hear what we're going to do next, just say, you know, finish that activity, finish playing with your friends, finish your game, whatever, or the picture, or whatever they're doing, and then we need to talk about what we're going to do next, and then leave them alone, and then they know for a few minutes, and then they know, okay, some, um, we're going to be doing something else, and that can help them transition. And don't we appreciate that when other people do that? And you'll notice in adult meetings, that we're go to, you know, someone up from up front is the MC that's going to transition you from one activity to the next, and that is 
you know, something that we appreciate. We want to know what's, we look at our watches, we see what time it is, we see what, we look at the schedule, we read the bulletin in church, we know what we're going to be doing next. And that's really helpful. We have that need and children do too. So then after you come back, then you can say, and this is kind of like step three, this is basically three steps. <laughs> Um, and so step three is that you're going to start talking about the next activity, the goal that we're going to next. We want to try to make it as inviting as possible and including their ideas, if it's possible, about it to prepare them to cross this transition bridge to the new activity. Um, we want to help them to be able to connect with it and think about the new activity for a minute. Um, try to give them something to look forward to, to motivate them as well. This will help fuel an easier transition as they connect with it on their own, their own ideas. Um, hopefully it's a positive activity, like we're gonna get ready to go, um, we're gonna go swimming, that would be an awesome, they, they transition easy for something like that. Um, if it's something harder, maybe we're gonna do, we're gonna have to clean up Oh, you know, they don't, that's not an exciting thing. Maybe there's a chore they have to do. I like to, after this new activity may be not what they really want to do, I like to give them a, um, something to look forward to that is fun after that. So we can say something like, um, well, after we clean up, you know, this mess, or after we do our chore, then maybe we can read a book together. Or maybe we can do that other activity I had to say no to at another time. And I want to give that, you know, well, we didn't get to do that before. So after we do the dishes, why don't we do thus and so to give them um, some kind of a help in transitioning? And you know what's, um, so this, this way of doing it just solves so much problems so that you're not saying, all right, let's, you know, we're, we're ready to leave, clean up those toys right now, um, and, and just push them right through with, with uh, you haven't done your chores yet, you know you have to do those dishes, I told you yesterday it's your day to do the dishes, et cetera, et cetera. It can just be all this negative guilt that is laid on them in such a way that makes transition slower, actually. Do you save any time by getting into a big fight and the kicking and screaming and all that resistance? You're, you're not saving any time by doing that. <laughs> and um, the more you do this, the faster transition goes. They trust you. They know you have your best, their best in your mind and that they feel more loved and valued and they're able to transition faster and faster. And then when something comes up where you have to go really fast, they can go with you. And they say, if we had more time, I'd let you play a little longer, but because daddy really needs to go to this or because um, our appointment is set at this, we're gonna just have to kind of rush and maybe afterwards we can do it. You know, And so that, that you can really cushion the emotion and the transition there. Um, so that gives you uh, something that I have found, especially when you're dealing with a large group of kids every day in the classroom and you're having to transition. Transition can be the biggest obstacle to a, a loving, smooth running classroom. And once you get this down, then people are transitioning here and there and everywhere with, um, um, with smoothness, with love and with, uh, trust in you as the teacher and the leader. And so I just want to pass this really important um, puzzle piece to you because I see it as being, I don't know, sometimes I think it's 50% of the, the problems that I witness when I'm see, observing other parents working with their children. Sometimes I think 50% of it is just not understanding the need to transition children. And so I think that um, if you try it and give it a try and try to fit it into your life, you'll have, it'll take a transition to, for you to be able to use this. But um, you know, I think it's well worth your while to take the time to, to think about how you want to start uh, transitioning your children. Um, I will be having these notes on our website, uh, mountainrefugeministries.com that you can go back and look at the steps 
and see how do I transition my child. Um, once you're sold on the idea, then, and you can observe good running smooth classrooms, either at church in your Sabbath school departments or Sunday school departments, go and watch the teachers at, who are using some of these skills and you'll see how, um, how much better it makes. Or maybe your students are at a school where you say, boy, this is a really good teacher. Watch them transition their students and show that respect at each uh, area and you'll be like, okay, this is worth giving a try. So I just encourage you to do that. Um, I don't know if you would like to share uh, an example. Um, we have a parent here that can, can give a little example of how transition can help in, in her homeschool uh, situation, which has been very beneficial. So if you can do that. Um, this is a scenario that has happened more than once. <laughs> So as an example of something that used to happen all the time to me, um, but I've been trying to do it differently and it's really been working. Um, I'm very, I'm not very great at structure and routine, so often I would get very distracted um, during the day with other tasks that I had to complete, and my kids would just go outside and play. And they would, you know, on a nice day, they'd be outside doing awesome things, making a fort, you know, playing in the creek, whatever. We used to live in the woods um, just up till recently. so. They had lots of fun things to do outside, and they would um, be getting along and doing a good job, and I would get a whole bunch of things done and just be just really focusing on all my to-do lists and doing laundry and making phone calls and all these things, um, and hours would go by, and then all of a sudden I would realize, oh, we've got to do some school because they're doing homeschool. We still are, um, but it's working better now. Um, oh no, we have, to, we have to get some homeschool done before dinner time, you know, or I'm a failure. So all of a sudden I would go outside and call the kids in. Kids, come in right now, we've got to get some homeschool done. And here I'm feeling guilt and stress and anxiety because I haven't um, done any school. And it's really, you know, I'm the leader and it's really my job to, to get them to do that. So I was feeling that guilt and um, really tempted to just put it all on them. So I just call them in, come on, come on, come on, we got to do school, we got to do this, that. And of course, I would meet resistance because they were really, their whole minds were, were absorbed and encapsulated in, in what they were involved in and, and their little blueprints that they had been carrying out that day. Um, you know, my, uh, whatever it might be, and you know what that might be for your kid, what they can get really focused on. And I would just be ripping them away and saying, we got to do what's on my mind. Um, so I'd meet a lot of resistance and it would cause you know, trouble. And when they would resist, I would say things like, you guys don't know how lucky you are. Most kids don't get to play all day outside and they're sitting in school for eight hours doing page after page after page and I ask you to do you know, just a little bit of work and you complain and it's, you know, if you're not careful, I'm gonna send you back to school. <laughs> Something like that. It sounds so awful and it is awful. Um, but since I've been learning these transition principles, um, I can do a lot better and so I realized what was happening before is that I was making a positive thing that they had been doing all day and they'd really been doing nothing wrong, they'd been doing good things and I was like making it into a negative thing as if they had been doing something wrong so now I can go outside and look at, you know, come and check out what they've been doing and say, wow, you've been doing this, this and this, you've got a lot done today. Was that a lot of fun? And, you know, what are your plans with this? And just kind of put words around what they have been doing and then say, and then I could, um, um, you know, just be connecting with them in that. And then I could start talking about, well, um, I've been getting a lot of stuff done too, but I realized that we have some school to do, you know, that I want to get done. Um, so, how about I give you, how, how much time do you need to finish that up? Would five or ten minutes and we can kind of negotiate a reasonable length of time to, that they know that they're going to have to wrap it up and they can kind of, you know, put that bow and that knot around it. And then um, sometimes I've found that in this sort of situation that a transitional activity can be a good plan. Um, so if they've been outside playing like all in right brain creative thing, maybe coming inside and having a snack because it's something kind of more like, yeah, I am kind of hungry, more motivating for them to come in and get a snack and then we can kind of be drawing them in from outside, getting them indoors, getting them at the table, which is where we do homeschool anyway. 
Um, and, and that can be kind of a nice transition. And then during the snack, I've been talking about what we're going to do next and helping them to, to kind of be prepared for that <coughs> next thing. And like Karen said, having like a nice reward to do afterwards um, is always helpful too. And it doesn't have to be big. Does that have to be like, oh, we're going to go out for ice cream? It can be something small. Um, quality time for lots of kids is is really important. So that's been helping me a whole lot, and I've been applying it to other situations too. And I just find that helps everybody get along a lot better. <laughs> thank you so much. Absolutely, it really really does help. And thank you for sharing that. Um, and that's a really good example. And I know a quick example that I have. With my grandchildren, I had um, my older grandson is eight, and he was at my house. And at the same time, I had my younger grandson, who is two, and um, they were both at my house together. And we were um, normally we would stay a little bit longer. And then I realized that um, I needed to help a friend out and go over and take care of a dog that was being um, that was by itself and it needed to be checked on it might have been by itself a couple of days and the water and food need to be checked on and to see if the dog was still there and that kind of thing and so we kind of needed to leave fairly soon because the sun was going down and I wanted to do it in the daylight so I could you know make sure I find the dog while it was still day and um, but the you know they were had all kinds of things that they wanted to still do at grandma's house and it had been, you know, kind of a shortened visit then, and they'd been asking me for weeks to come over, and I hadn't been able to have them over for a long time. So I thought, okay, this is going to be interesting. So uh, with the older grandson, I went ahead and explained the whole situation about the dog, and I, um, and I, I even gave him a choice. I said, do you want to go over in the day, and maybe we can take time to play with the dog? And they have a playground, they have um, swings and stuff over there too. We could play on their swings, or do you think, uh, or would you like to stay to stay here longer? And we can go after dark if you want, because it's not the end of the world. We can go feed the dog in the dark with a flashlight. If um, you know, some things are not negotiable, but if you use them in the decision making as much as as feasible and possible. It really helps them when you have to lay down the line and say, you know, we're not going to do that. That's not going to work out um, this time, you know. And then you can you have more <laughs> uh, a more cooperative spirit when you've already negotiated with them in the past. And so this was negotiable, and we talked it through. And he thought about it for a while, maybe even five minutes before he came up with what maybe he would like to do. I said we can play, and I gave him options of things we can play here or options of things we can do there and worked it all out and um, and so he wanted to go early he thought yeah let's go early let's see if we can have some fun and play with the dog so we could you know play ball with the dog or whatever you want to do and so we had made that decision and we worked you know and I, then we talked about the cleanup and everything and so we all that was working out really well and I had forgotten to transition the two-year-old and so I just it totally slipped my mind because he, you know, my older grandson and I were bonding and we were having a great time and and so then all of a sudden I'm starting to scoop him up and he starts screaming and it was like ah oh. I told, I didn't even tell him what we were gonna do or anything so I was like okay er, we're gonna stop everything and transition the two year old now. Um, yes, he's small enough. I could have grabbed him up, kicking and screaming. And drug, he was having so much fun with the, the new car thing that we have, a car garage and everything. He was all into that. I could scoop him up and grab him kicking and screaming all the way and force to, to, to buckle him in. And he's a strong little boy, but I could have probably done it, okay? Um, but I would have developed mistrust and, um, in him at that point and also be harder when he's not to and I can't grab him and shove him in the car seat and buckle him in. You know, when he's six and, and eight, you know, like the old one, you can't do that anymore. And when they're 15, you can't do that anymore. So let's build those pathways now. And I said, oh, that's right, Philip, you don't know what we're doing. 
kids understand way more than you think they understand. So he's sitting there and he's listening and playing a little slower and quietly. He's listening to, to um, me work with him now. And I said, Junior and I, we've, we've already talked about it, but you didn't get a turn to hear what we want to do. So then I explained to, to him about the dog and, and um, how he might be hungry and he might be thirsty and, you know, making it little kid language. And would you like to go play with the dog? And so we talked until he was connecting with it. Then I also did something and that my grandkids are used to, and my daughter too, I used to do this when she was one and two, um, is that I put words around his feelings that he was having that was not even about the, the transition part. What he, he was also, I knew, feeling a little bit frustrated like his love cup had not really been filled up at grandma's house like he wanted because I had spent quite a bit of time with the older, older grandson. Um, usually I just bring the one, the two-year-old, and uh, or the other one. I don't bring them at the same time. And then I just focus on them and fill their love cups and everything's about him. Well, now I have two of them. And so neither one got the, the usual attention. Um, but I verbalized that for him and I said, did I play with him quite, your older brother quite a bit? I didn't get to play with you as long as I usually do. Usually it's just you and me here and we just get to play all these things together. And um, so we talked about that and I said, maybe, um, I, I explained that maybe he can come again where it's just him and I and we'll play together and he's just relaxing, his face is relaxing and all of a sudden he said, okay, let's go. He was ready. He transitioned right away after I was able to explain what he was feeling, which is, we didn't get to finish. I didn't get time with Grandmommy the way I wanted to, and I just knew he was feeling that way. So by verbalizing it and helping him, and he knew we were going to go see a dog and everything, all of a sudden he was ready, and whoop, we went right out, and he jumped in the car, buckled, and he's excited now. And so that situation was able to, to turn into a positive situation instead of a negative situation that once again builds those blocks for the next time, the next time, all the way to the teen years and into adulthood as well because now they know how to transition themselves. They know how to have better skills in the workplace, in school, um, as adults, uh, so much more mature because of the foundation that we're laying for them that um, for for life and laying for them for a relationship with Jesus because there's so many young people so many adults that have a resistance toward the Holy Spirit they have a resistance toward God because they don't feel that he's going to love them and understand them and meet their deepest needs and we want to show them by our example how eager Jesus is to meet our deepest needs and that even though we may be coping as adults with addictions or ways of meeting our needs the wrong way Jesus is saying you don't need those addictions anymore you don't need those unhealthy pathways I will meet your needs right here he says I am the good shepherd and I will lead you by quiet waters I will restore your soul I'll keep you safe even though it's there's death and danger all around you, I am going to meet your every need. I'm going to anoint you with that oil. In that Psalm 23, it talks about the whole steps of how Jesus is going to meet our needs. I'm going to anoint you with um, oil at the table, um, even in midst of your enemies, which is I'm going to meet your blueprint. I'm going to help you meet your blueprint your drives, everything. He's saying, I will meet all of those needs. And so we can say that to our children all along to develop that trust, to prepare them, to give their hearts fully to God. And it will help to heal us too as we walk with our children in this pathway. So I just encourage each one of you as you are working with your children to, um, to keep these things in mind to help smooth the pathway so that our whole family very soon can be saved in the kingdom of heaven to live the way heaven does, to live um, perfectly in heaven the way God had meant for it to be. So let's bow our heads now and ask the Lord to help us to be able to accomplish these things. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you so much how you want to meet all of our needs. And we have a great need to be good parents to have a smooth running home, to have loving home 
the way you meant and the way it would be if we were in heaven. And we just pray that you'll teach us those principles, help us to walk in that path that you have put before us as our good shepherd, and that you will help us to shepherd those lambs as under shepherds, the way you would handle them, the way you would love them and nurture them. Just give us that ability because in our own strength we cannot do it. So we just ask for you to give us those victories. And we thank you and praise you that you will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.